I'm Carol Reynolds. This is Wind Notes with the Dallas Winds. And my guest today is Jake Nisley of, well, so many places and so many things. Currently principal percussionist for the San Francisco Symphony, professor of percussion and probably teaches all kinds of other things with the gifts this man has. And he is going to be the, the center of the concert with this fabulous new piece that he's going to tell us about uh, in our April concert. I'm just so glad in your schedule, which has to be very, very busy that you can be with me today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I am really excited about this upcoming opportunity with Dallas Wins. Well, Dallas Wins is just always looking for the the neatest, the coolest, the most powerful, the, the most explosive, filled with fireworks, always the concert. But this is going to be a particularly important concert. And at the core of it is this piece that Losing Earth that um, you have very personal connections with. This is not just some piece you picked up out of the music library. So maybe we could start with you just telling us how this all came about and how it became kind of your piece. Sure. Well, I had the great fortune of having a prior relation with uh, composer Adam Schoenberg of this great piece. He and I were graduate students at Juilliard in New York at the same time. And, you know, through a sort of roundabout way, became friends while we were students and kept in touch. And I had the opportunity, while Michael Tilson Thomas was the music director of the San Francisco Symphony, to commission a percussion concerto, which is not that often we get the chance to do that. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and he gave me pretty full leeway of what I wanted to do and listed a few of the pieces that existed. And I really... You know, I pushed to have a commission done and he gave me carte blanche to choose the composer, which, you know, I looked wow. immediately to Adam because I love that his music is maybe more tonal, uh, more um, in the world that he and I share a sort of musical language. And so when we came together for this idea, he came up to San Francisco a number of times. He lives in Los Angeles. I went down there a few different times, but basically he allowed the piece to be sort of centered around my particular skill sets. And so my background ranges from drum corps international, marching, you know, marching band in high school, marching band in college. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, I did a degree in jazz in my undergrad at Northwestern University. Um, you know, and there are elements of improv. The entire piece, as you'll see, starts with uh, marching bass drums and surround sound around the Meyerson uh, with me playing an actual marching snare drum um literally marching through the audience um as though i were playing uh, in a street parade or on a football field and so um yeah i don't know if i would call it my piece i i think the goal is we would love for so many people to take this piece on and perform it and you know what i think is a, a utilization of the modern percussionist skill set you know uh so many of us now have that background that pedagogy in marching in drum set in marimba, um, for some folks, piano, um, you know, and sort of combining all these things for the modern percussionist, this piece has elements of lyrical vibraphone playing. So you're playing very slow and very soft. You know, like I said, the opening is very loud and energetic. Uh, there's a whole movement where you're, I'm playing xylophone and kick drum and temple blocks. And so it's sort of uh, what we call a Frankenstein drum set um, made, made 10 times harder by playing a xylophone in the middle of all of it. And so it's really kind of taking that skill set and kind of trying to move this vehicle forward. There aren't that many percussion concerti that exist. Um, Adam is really versatile in the sense that we were able to premiere it with the San Francisco Symphony. It's been performed with some other symphony orchestras, but now making the crossover to the band world for me is very important because that's my background. Like growing up in Iowa, um, you know, that my school did not have a string orchestra at all. Um, but marching band was super important. Drumline was a huge part of my high school upbringing. Like I said, I marched drum corps as well when I was in high school. And so bringing that to the band world, I think, exposes a lot of people who may not otherwise have the opportunity to play in a youth orchestra or a symphony orchestra at their school, gives them the chance to dive into a really great piece like this. Well, you, you've really covered the whole American musical landscape in our modern times. I mean, you're exactly right. For so many people, the band is the ensemble and, and they have that like, really deep, rich tradition. And they may not even realize how important it is in American music 
history, I guess you could say, or future. Um, so to see this combined on this high level orchestrally, in terms of the wind ensemble, the, the musical intensity, the themes behind it, um, it kind of is, is a, it, it's sort of its own world. And, and I have had the pleasure in the last several days to prepare to meet you virtually, um, doing something that we all do now in the modern world. I get online and I've found some wonderful things that I've been able to see that you've put there with colleagues, friends, contemporaries, um, both demonstrating things about how you practice percussion and what you do in every day and then parts of the sound palette that this piece will have. Um, and I have to say, watching you do your initial drills, um, People don't know what percussionists do to get where you are, particularly, but really any competent percussionist. They, they have a very limited idea. And listen, I, I try to spread that message a lot when I speak to general audiences, but there's a, a big prejudice against percussion. Would you, in terms of seeing it within the orchestra, I know I've said about 11 things, but maybe one of those you like. Um, <laughs> but I, the respect that percussionists ought to have uh, is exemplified in what you have done. So how does it feel to be at the center of that swirl? Um, I can say like any other instrument to really truly master it, it's all about the fundamentals. And so my practicing, you know, depending on what you may have seen out there, there's a very long video I have with Vic Firth with whom I have an artist, artist relationship. You know, I have my own snare drum stick with them, which is, really a blessing to have that opportunity, which again, goes back to my marching band roots. Um, my my daily routine, which I am in the midst of right now, um, uh, Monday is my day off in the orchestral world. So my son is at kindergarten and I practice for two or three hours on a Monday here, just the most basic fundamentals, you know, something we call stick control, using the metronome very slowly, um, working on evenness, just the same stuff that I was working on when I was starting in fourth or fifth grade, you know? Um, and, you know, I would say I'm not unique amongst my peers who are in these positions in these major symphony orchestras in that we all obviously have a love for music, but also a work ethic that, you know, is, is apparent in anyone who achieves greatness in any industry, whether you're a figure skater or a surgeon or whatever, you know, you choose to be excellent at. So I've had the fortune of some great teachers along the way. Um, growing up in Iowa, uh, I had a great teacher named Woody Smith, who actually later relocated to Fort Worth down in, in the Texas uh, Metroplex area. Um, you know, great teachers along the way, Michael Burrett. Um, just, you know, I, I think that percussion is such a relatively young instrument in the sort of orchestral landscape and in terms of it being used even as a solo vehicle is even younger you know the solo marimba is really you know around 100 years old you know writing for it in a, in a classical sense the percussion concerto is still less than 100 years old i could get fact checked on that one but it's real, right around there with the mio and the crested marimba concerto and so you know there's a lot of space to grow um, to sort of reimagine, you know, we have great other composers now like Andy Akiho, who really pushed the envelope with percussion and he has a drum corps background and a steel pan background and just sort of taking, you know, percussion is so diverse and almost limitless that, you know, you could never master all the instruments, you know, you could be an orchestral percussionist to audition for an orchestra. Now the, the requirements are so much broader than they used to be, you know, it's, it's marimba, it's multi-percussion, it's triangle, it's bass drum, it's snare drum, it's vibraphone, it's drum set often, it's so many things. And, you know, I think percussionists have achieved, I, I, I don't feel any uh, less respected in the orchestra. I, I know the, uh, we could say stigma or stereotype of, of yesteryear, I think is gone because people see what we have to do and what the responsibility of an orchestral percussionist is and you know a lot of that goes back to our training playing wind ensemble and playing percussion ensemble and you know playing these pieces that really feature percussion in a way that you know i love brahms and i love beethoven it's the it's the backbone of that of that music of you know western classical music but they didn't write a ton for percussion <laughs> and so um you know i love to play the triangle on brahms four but there are 
many other skill sets that we need to have challenged in a piece like Adams, you know, bringing it back to losing earth uh, really pushes it. And not just for me, but for the other percussionists, as everyone will see, there's a really heavy, you know, back and forth conversation between myself and the rest of the percussionists. And they're, the writing is at a highly virtuosic level for them as well. So. And you, fun. you're aware of that. I mean, you, it is a dialogue. You're back maybe to them more or less, or, you know, you're not standing with them, but they're with that, that thing that happens and people aren't used to that. You know, they they have the model of you with the timpani, you know, back in a Beethoven symphony or something. And to realize that there's this arc going on, uh, electric arc all over the, the ensemble. Um, if you could just light it all up and have, you know, you do light it up and, and that's gotta be very exciting. Do you, um, do you feel very different when you walk into a piece like this uh, off stage when you're preparing, as opposed to say a standard you're doing Mahler or you're doing, I mean, is, is it a different Jake who wakes up that morning? Uh, no, I mean, I was just telling my students, we just played Mahler 6 at San Francisco Symphony this last weekend, which has the famous two blows of fate with the gigantic hammer. And I, of course, play that. And I told them verbatim, I would rather play Losing Earth. I'm, I'm less nervous to play Losing Earth than I am to play the hammer in a Mahler symphony because, you know, the way we were with Michael Tilson Thomas, our former music director, famous for his recordings and he was back and we had some really special performances this last weekend and he likes the theatric element of the box and so i was up and i had to climb into the choir loft and get this huge hammer and you know it's of course that takes less like hourly preparation than a piece like adams but you're so on the spot if you mess that up you are no that's uh, unforgivable right and so it's and i, I didn't I didn't mess it up, um, but it was, it was, it was one of those, you know, my heart is pounding before I walk out into the choir loft for everyone in the whole Davies Symphony Hall to be like, Whoa, what's that? What's that person doing? You know, then it is, you know, to play. So look, every note I play in the percussion section is by myself every week. doesn't matter if it's Brahms four, it doesn't matter if it's Mahler six, doesn't matter if it's Bolero, you know, uh, or a random Bruckner symphony with one cymbal crash, which exists, right? Um, these are moments that, you know, we're, we can't hide. And I'm not saying that violinists practice any less, you know, but there, there are 16 to 20, I should know this number, that's terrible. There are 26, I think, on stage at any given time, or 28 violins on stage. And so, you know, uh, it's not the same as, you know, I always say it's, I equate it to being a fireman. You sit around for a while and then, oh my gosh, everything's on fire and now you're totally on. And so uh, the concerto, I'm totally on for the whole 20 some minutes. That yeah. is maybe a little bit different. It is more exhausting than playing a Mahler symphony uh, for me, but it doesn't feel necessarily different because I kind of am always on my own when you play, you know, when you play a one to a stand part, as we say, you know, whether you're first trumpet or second bassoon, or certainly you're playing the triangle or the crash symbols, people are going to hear you do that. Right. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it goes with the territory. So. I've heard you say that when you practice and certainly it seems to me good advice for students, um, you do it to the point where you know that you've you've got it at a level that's above even if I if I understood you correctly in one of those videos, so that you know you have it um, again above and beyond. Or did I do you recall where you might have? <laughs> at least that's what I took from it. So that if you know you've got it here, and the actual yeah. demand is here. I mean, is that is that a basic piece of wisdom for all those kids out in band? All those all, just. Tell us how that seems to you to, to know you can nail it, hopefully, at least. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that gets into a, a, another level of maybe psychology almost of, you know, it's not about the amount of hours you practice something, right? It's more about how you're practicing it, how you're mastering it. And so what I think I can, but the basic gist of what I'm teaching when I, you know, whatever video you saw there is, I will practice something to the point where I can do it with the metronome clicking once every eight measures. Um, and then that needs to be enough, right? You know, you need to, you don't need to do it 20 more times, which I think there's a sort of, there's a law of diminishing returns at a certain point. And so psycho psychologically, 
you want to, you know, if you can do it like that with the metronome, you definitely know it. And then you need to also believe that. And so there's a whole disconnect where people, and I think this is applicable to whether you're playing your drumline show from memory or you're playing at a win ensemble competition or a high stakes or a percussion concerto like Adam's piece, which I play from memory, you know, um, memorizing music, I think is really an essential skill that percussionists want to have. And, you know, you need to be able to step away from the instrument. I always say, and sit on your hands and be able to see your mallet part light up on the keyboard, you know, very slowly. It doesn't need to be a tempo necessarily, but really knowing a piece, really internalizing, really taking time away from the instrument. Cause I know, you know, a message for high school students, right? I mean, between AP classes or a drum line or whatever other extracurriculars people do, I certainly didn't practice every day in high school. I wanted to, but there was, there was no way to do that, but I would sit in maybe calculus class or whatever. And imagine my, my marimba solo light up in front of me or, you know, like probably too much, but, um, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where I think students get in a, especially at that age, cause I was this way, I would practice things relentlessly, you know, like 75 times, like literally, which, you know, maybe at a certain age is helpful for certain things, but I think you can overdo it. And sort of, if you mess it up one time, then you create this negative feedback loop in your head. And then you've kind of wasted an hour practicing something that if you had done it, you know, I always tell my students the five times in a row rule, five times in a row when you turn the page, you know, that's a pretty high stakes level challenge anyway. But if you can do it, you know, let's say you're playing a a xylophone excerpt from a Gershwin piece. You know, if you can do it, Porgy and Bess is the famous one. You know, if you can do it five times in a row with the metronome in different iterations, you got it. You know, move on to the next thing, right? You don't need to also do it five more times and then, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, I, if we had more time, I could I could dive into that more. But it's about, you know, how to practice efficiently, basically. Yeah. And all that's what's behind when you walk out on that stage. So I'm going to ask you, I mean, again, I could, it's so lovely to speak with you. And I can think of so many things that would be nice to ask. But if, if you can imagine being a middle school student from a medium city and you're coming into the Meyerson for this concert and you have had, you know what the level of exposure would be, but you've certainly never done this evening before in that gorgeous facility with the, the Dallas winds, with this piece, with you. What do you think? I mean, can you imagine yourself in that role and some of the things that might really go into your mind, heart and ears? Sure. I mean, I, I can imagine that role being from a very small town in Iowa and, you know, getting to go see Evelyn Glenny. Uh, famous, famous percussionist. She was a pioneer uh, for many reasons and going to see her when I was, I think in eighth grade, um, you know, I was, I, I was not prepared for that. I had not been exposed to anything like that. And we're talking, you know, we said before, this is pre YouTube didn't exist. You know, this is uh, in the nineties. So um, I, I think the best thing is just to be, of course, open-minded. Percussionists tend to inherently be open-minded anyway about music because you're playing such a diverse array of instruments. Even if you're in marching band, one year you might play quads, one year you might play bass drum, you know, snare drum, whatever. Um, you know, I think for the younger percussionists, um, and maybe this has changed over time because I certainly have seen some very young, great marimba players, but. Um, take note of the fact that percussion can be both really powerful and in your face and faster, louder, faster, louder, but also really elegant and really cool and really, you know, like, uh, like swimming underwater in slow motion. You know, that's what the, uh, the vibraphone movement of this piece is meant to evoke. He calls it the underwater world and sort of, you know, something I didn't appreciate as much at that age, but understanding that, you know, percussion can be, have such an enormous, dynamic range, such an enormous, you know, sonority range, soundscape, you know, we're going from a Kevlar snare drum, which probably will be the most familiar sound to most people, to some vibraphone where I'm playing simultaneously with uh, uh, tuned Thai gongs, which creates this almost gamelan-like sound, which maybe no one knows what that is, but it's, it's a type of music from from Indonesia, which they play on these metallic instruments. And so it's just, it's a very, you know, talk about a jarring within two minutes, you've got this like, you know, pristine outdoor marching snare drum sound. And then this almost like 
drone, super slow mo. The vibraphone has the vibrato wheel going, so you're hearing this like wow, 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 along with the sonority of these tuned gongs. It's really an exquisite pairing by Adam. Um, and something that we worked out logistically. So I could show him how you do these, the re- I'm imitating the gongs are up here, the vibraphone is down here. So you can see my snare going back there. Um, you know, uh, and I will say one thing about the piece you can pay attention to is how open to suggestion Adam was as well in helping me make some of the part a little more percussionist friendly, which not all composers Uh most are not open to that kind of suggestion but because we are friends uh you know he the content every single idea is his but some of the logistical uh setup and execution of it was done in a collaboration which certainly makes the piece more user-friendly if it just comes in the mail and say okay i've got a star student who wants to try to take this, try to play this piece, it makes sense because you can tell a percussionist wrote some side notes in there being like, he means this, you know, um, which is really helpful. Oh my goodness. It's, it's going to be a, an extraordinary evening. And I'm just so glad you're able to bring, to be there, to be a part of this tradition in Dallas, which is, um, I mean, one of the most exciting things I've ever been around, I have to say, in terms of so much new music, so many dynamic performers, so many sounds that would not be otherwise, you know, and something that you take away and you can share. It's, it, it's, um, it's far more than a concert, as you well know. And I just want to thank you for uh, stopping that routine long enough to share these thoughts (laughs) with us. And for everyone, boy, this is one you want to be sitting uh, right wherever you can get. Hanging off the roof will be just fine, too, right, (laughs) for this particular. (laughs) You'll hear it. You'll You'll hear it. it, That's for (laughs) sure. And and you'll be you'll be moved. This piece is gorgeous. And um, I just. I I wish we could do it just about this very evening, but you uh, you're coming soon, and everybody get get ready for this one, and I look forward to to seeing you there, and and um, I can only thank you one more time. Thank you, thank you, thanks again. Thank you.